Let's get some insight on today's events on Capitol Hill from Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan, the ranking Republican on the House Oversight Committee. Thank you for being here, Congressman. I want to get your thoughts on uh, today's hearing. What's your takeaway? I think the, the first takeaway is Michael Cohen's delusional. He actually said in the hearing that he, Michael Cohen, is the one who launched the Trump presidential campaign because he started some website back in 2011. So again, I don't think you can trust anything he says. He actually argued disagreed with what the Southern District of New York prosecutors said when they said in their sentencing memo that he was wanting to get a job in the White House. He says, no, I didn't. I didn't want a job in the White House. So when you're disagreeing with the prosecutors to a crime, you played the guys who you pled guilty to a crime and saying you're the guy who launched the presidential campaign. Um, I don't know that you can take much of what he says at any real value. What about the specifics on the hush payments, as he called them, the 11 payments uh, to him, the checks that he brought uh, and set into, into the record? What was your take on that? Well, first of all, remember, Brett, there was no new evidence here because if there was any new evidence, the prosecutors wouldn't have allowed it to be heard in an open set. They would be, they would be part of an ongoing investigation. So there was nothing new here. And Michael Cohen can't have it every way he wants. On one hand, he said, it was my dream job. I was the president's personal lawyer. And then on the other hand, he says, but I wasn't getting any payments in the, reform, in the form of a retainer over the time period that I was actually his personal lawyer. So, again, I don't think you can believe much of what this guy says. What I do think was going on today is I think this was the first step in the Democrats' crazy impeachment plans. Understand this, Brett. Last week, Tom Steyer, mega donor for the Democrats, was in Jerry Nadler's district organizing a town hall meeting to persuade Mr. Nadler to go ahead and move ahead with impeachment. Two nights ago, Tom Steyer was in Baltimore in Chairman Cummings district organizing a town hall encouraging his constituents to push Chairman Cummings to move ahead with impeachment. That's what this thing was about today, the crazy impeachment plans of the Democrats. You know, uh, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie watched the hearing today, uh, former Trump confidant, obviously. Uh, here's what he had to say about the Republican questioning. I think the interesting thing is that there hasn't been one Republican yet who's tried to defend the president on the substance. And I think that's something that should be concerning to the White House. Why are no Republicans standing up and defending the president on the substance? And and that's either a failure of those Republicans on the, on the Hill or a failure of the White House to have a unified strategy with them. They knew what was coming with Michael Cohen. Your reaction to that? Michael Cohen can't be trusted. The Democrats' first announced witness of this Congress is a guy who is going to prison, will be a federal inmate in two months for lying to Congress. So, I mean, come on, we did have actually members do, uh, did defend and, and dig into some of the issues. I think in particular, Congressman Massey did when he questioned uh, Mr. Cohen about if you made this, made this payment and didn't even know whether it was legal or not, what kind, of, what kind of lawyer are you? So we did have some members dig into those issues, but the bottom line is how can you trust anything this individual has to say? When he repeatedly said that he could not talk about certain things because they are under investigation by the Southern District of New York, is that not a red flag to the Trump administration, to the president? We don't know what he's referring to, Brett. Maybe he's referring to the special counsel. Uh, we don't know what he's referring to. We don't know. We didn't get to get into some of these questions. We don't know what the uh, Southern District of New York or the special counsel's office told him relative to what he couldn't and couldn't say in today's hearing. And remember, Mr. Cummings said the scope was so limited, Mr. Cummings said just things that he felt that uh, members should be able to ask about. Frankly, I think they were designed to be uh, things that only Mr. Cummings thought were going to be embarrassing to the president. So uh, we don't know what that means. We'll have to just wait and see. All right. But what about the specifics? I mean, I understand all of your points about credibility. I understand all of the things about undermining his veracity. He is a flawed, flawed witness. But what about the substance. I mean, the president writing a check to him while president for these payments, these 11 payments that he says were to pay off Stormy Daniels and the other woman. Brett, uh, that is that not true? Brett, Michael Cohen said he was the personal lawyer for the president. He was there was a retainer arrangement where he was paid these installments, these payments over the course of the time. He was the personal lawyer for the president and the Trump organization. 
I don't think that's unusual. My guess is there's all kinds of companies, all kinds of individuals who have a similar type of relationship. That's what was brought out today. And again, where was the new news? I, there wasn't any new news here. And if there was any new evidence, no prosecutor would have allowed it to be heard today in an open hearing like this in Congress. Well, there were some things that were under oath that perked some ears because you had him saying he did never he never went to Prague. Uh, there, he doesn't believe or doesn't hadn't heard of anything about Russia collusion. Uh, there are some things that Republicans would say, hey, we, we are on with that. But you said his credibility is shot, right? Well, every once in a while, you'll get some truth from some people. I mean, we, we saw it last week. <laughs> Right, Andy McCabe's the guy who lied three times under oath and is under investigation. But he did say one thing in the last couple of weeks on his book tour. He's the third person who was told us Rod Rosenstein was serious about wearing a wire and invoking the 25th Amendment. When you're the third person I've heard it from, other people we've deposed, that's probably some, one thing in Andy McCabe's statements that's accurate. So maybe Michael Cohen did say a few things that were accurate. One of those, of course, was he's never been to Prague, which, again, the Democrats didn't want to focus on that because, remember, that goes right to the heart of all this. The dossier was the key. The Clinton campaign paid Perkins Coie, who hired Glenn Simpson, who hired the foreigner Christopher Steele, to put together the fake dossier, which the FBI used to go get the warrant to spy on Trump's campaign. And then when that whole scheme fell apart because the American people elected Donald Trump president, then they come with this plan. The Lanny Davis choreographed hearing with Michael Cohen, their star witness, who is going to prison in two months for lying. That's what took place today in that hearing. I have two more quick questions. Sure. One, you think that the president is, there's no fault here. He has nothing to worry about. I don't, there was no new news. I think as one of my colleagues said, uh, no new news, but um, some fake news. So I don't think there's anything here. There's nothing Second, new. Do you think the Democrats had a choice whether to hold this hearing today or wait until the president got back on U.S. soil? Well, they should have waited. That's that's for sure. And frankly, they should have, uh, I think, honored the request that Congressman Meadows and I had to the chairman, which is why not bring Rod Rosenstein in? Rod Rosenstein is deputy attorney general, oversees the Southern District of New York, oversaw the special counsel until just a couple months ago. Rod Rosenstein, what we know we've heard in the last couple weeks, it would have been nice to have both of them sitting side by side so we could get the real story, the full story. That would have been nice instead of a guy who's got a 30-minute opening statement, a guy who, again, is going to prison for lying to Congress. Congressman, we appreciate your time. We'll follow all the developments. Thanks. Let's get reaction now from the president and his team to the Cohen testimony. We start there at least. Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts traveling with the president here in Vietnam to cover the summit leads off with a pretty minimal response so far. Good morning, John. Good morning to you, Brad. So far, there has been no response to Cohen's testimony by President Trump other than a tweet that he sent out which preceded Cohen's testimony in which he said that Cohen had done bad things unrelated to Trump. One of the president's outside attorneys, though, Jay Sekulow, did respond to a portion of Cohen's testimony saying, quote, today's testimony by Michael Cohen that attorneys for the president edited or changed his statement to Congress to alter the duration of the Trump Tower Moscow negotiations is completely false. No question, though, Cohen's testimony on Capitol Hill today left the president fighting to keep his summit with Kim Jong-un in the news spotlight. The Michael Cohen testimony barged in on President Trump's second meeting with Kim Jong-un, the president refusing to answer questions about his former attorney. But we did get some insight into the president's thinking from South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, who spoke with him before Cohen's testimony. It did bother him that there's going to be a split screen between Michael Cohen and him meeting with uh, Kim Jong-un. And I said, well, that's just the world in which you live. In his meeting and social dinner with Kim, President Trump playing his cards close to his vest, but predicting success. A lot of things are going to be solved, I hope, and I think it'll lead to wonderful, it'll lead to really a wonderful situation long term. And our relationship is a very special relationship. President Trump and Kim Jong-un have a signing ceremony scheduled for this afternoon. The president is under pressure from both sides of the political aisle to make progress on Kim's promise at last June's first summit to dismantle his nuclear program. My bigger worry is probably that North Korea will give too little or nothing because um, what we saw last year is really no commitment 
of any substance. It is unclear what the president and Kim will sign, and the substance of a deal could shift during today's meetings. Ideas that have been kicked around are opening liaison offices in the United States and North Korea to facilitate ongoing dialogue, closing down the Yongbyon nuclear facility, an agreement to finally end the Korean War, and some modification of sanctions. President Trump has been trying to sell Kim on the economic benefits he could reap if he gives up his weapons of mass destruction, ends North Korea's isolation, and joins the global economy. And as I've said many times, and I say it to the press, I say it to anybody that wants to listen, I think that your country has tremendous economic potential, unbelievable, unlimited. And I look forward to watching it happen and helping it to happen. North Korea experts tell Fox News it is unlikely Kim would give up his nuclear program all at once. There is still deep distrust of the United States in North Korea. One of the president's goals this week and in his one-on-one -on -one meeting last night, to build trust between the two countries. Or if you could have heard that dialogue, what you would pay for that dialogue, that was good. We will find out more about how the summit went and what the two leaders agreed to when President Trump holds a press conference this afternoon. It's also a safe bet that he will be asked about the Cohen testimony as well. Brett? We'll cover all of that right here. John, thank you. Meantime, the story we brought you, justices on the U.S. Supreme Court will decide whether a cross on public land in Maryland constitutes an illegal endorsement of religion by the government. Fox News chief legal correspondent and anchor of Fox News at Night, Shannon Bream, tells us about today's arguments. It saddens me, actually, to be here standing before you. Veterans from across the country showed up at the Supreme Court today fighting to preserve a 40-foot-high World War I memorial in the shape of a cross. It was built with private funds in an effort headed by the American Legion a century ago. An atheist group has spent years fighting to get rid of the cross in Maryland, which originally sat on a plot of private land that has since been transferred to government ownership. Critics say that entanglement of government and religion is unconstitutional, while advocates for the so-called Peace Cross say it's a second war memorial. Today, Justice Kagan said many see it as much more. Quote, it is the foremost symbol of Christianity, isn't it? It invokes the central theological claim of Christianity that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross for humanity's sins. And while opponents of the monument argue the government sends a message of endorsement for Christianity by maintaining the cross-shaped memorial, Justice Alito asked about the alternative about other public monuments with potential religious symbolism, how they must be handled if, quote, we say you got to take down all of the crosses. What message does that send when people see that on TV? They see crosses all over the country being knocked down. Today, the steel beams left behind in the wake of 9-11, which many viewed as a cross-like symbol, got a lot of attention from the justices, provoking questions about where exactly the court should draw the line on government-involved displays involving religious imagery. Justice Gorsuch said today this is one of the only situations in which people are allowed to sue over something like this because it offends them, adding, we have to find a way to tolerate each other. A decision is due by late June. Brett. Shannon, thank you. See you tonight at 11.